Well, certainly it's good to be here and good to look into Yahweh's word and to consider what uh, he wants from us and to actually prove at times from scripture that what we see today is from him and, and not any other. Uh, some years ago, I was listening to a radio program in which they were interviewing a scientist and the scientist explained that what they know, scientists in general, and I'm glad we have more youth here today because we're going to be getting into a subject matter that I think is pertinent for them to understand, and that is science and scripture. And so uh, the scientist was explaining that basically they know very little of the un overall universe and the things that, you know, they're still discovering things even you know, on the on the sea floor, they're they're finally able to get some things down there and take a look, and they're finding things that are you know something like four miles down, and uh, are seeing fish down there, and they are discovering why they're able to to be down at that level because it crushes everything else. In fact, they they took a iron dome, which was about an inch thick, hollow inside, but it collapsed it once they brought it down to that, that level. But Yahweh knew what he was doing when he created everything, and he did create everything in its uh, way it's to be. And we'll get into a little bit of that today. But he described what, what they actually know. And he, he described the, you know, like taking a piece of bumper from a car and then trying to describe the drivetrain, the wheels, the roof, the doors, the trunk, the hood, the, the engine, all from a piece of a bumper. They can't do it. So they're, they're learning, and what they know is useful for us to understand because it helps confirm Scripture. And so we, we're going to point out a number of things today. But I think about some of the different... Uh, well, let me, let me just back up and say the, the Wikipedia Encyclopedia Online says that science in the broadest sense refers to any knowledge or trained skill, especially but not exclusively when it is a, obtained by very variable or verifiable means, rather. And thinking about some of the different areas of scripture which, we, we, which have been verified, Genesis is a good area to start. It's a good place to start when looking at topography of the earth in which we have a clear view from space. Uh, and even before space or, uh, exploration, the Earth has been basically mapped out. And so we can take a look at the map and, and have a clear view that uh, of what they call the Pangaea, the land mass all being one at one time, that that Pangaea has been broken apart. So we see the land mass of Earth was evidently one lo location with water making up the rest. And we get a visual description of this from Scripture in Genesis 1, 9 through 10. And then Elohim said, let the waters below the heavens be gathered into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And Elohim called the dry land earth and gathering of the waters he called seas or sea. And Elohim saw that it was good. So the Pangaea by looking at maps from space or looking at maps or from space, one can see basically big pieces of a puzzle being, you know, at one time all together, you know, one land mass. And this is, of course, before Noah's flood. And further along in Genesis, we read specific part of the passage in Genesis 7, which indicates fissures open up from the deep, deep below. Genesis 7 and verse 11. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month of the seventh day of the month, on that same day, all the founds of the deep, great deep, burst open, and the floodgates of the sky were open. So you're getting flood waters from beneath, you're getting waters from above. But scientists or geologists have mapped out under the Earth's surface water, water uh, reservoirs called aquifers. And in fact, there's uh, currently one in Kenya, uh, which they say because it's so large, could actually supply Kenyan uh, people there with water for 200 years. And so that's quite a bit of, of water to have access to. They are thinking about how to access that water. But that is just one 
one thing that they found. Uh, about 50 years ago, there, through uh, electromagnetic, like electromagnetic waves, they found an area on the east coast just off of the New York coastline there, basically 270 miles, 250 or 270 miles in diameter. And they can tell that it's there underneath the waters uh, because the uh, freshwater uh, sensors, well, the freshwater shows different than the, than the salt water. So there's a difference between the two. Uh, so that's another area, and they think there are other areas like that. In fact, oil rigs have tapped into other areas of fresh water underneath the ocean, uh, which is, you know, interesting. They don't know how many there are, but the one that they found, they said that there was enough fresh water to fill over a billion Olympic-sized swimming pools. So that's quite a bit of water. But still further down, uh, down past the Earth's mantle, 400 miles, they have found uh, in the transitional zone, also called the asthenosphere, uh, some scientists have suggested there may be as uh, at least an equal amount of the oceans or up to three times the amount of the oceans that, are, that we see today, the amount of water. They say that there's an equal amount, if not more, underneath, about 400 miles down. In 2014, they found a diamond uh, that was brought up by a, by a Brazilian volcano that had minerals in it. However, one of the minerals within the diamond uh, was named ringwoodite, actually contained water in it. And the diamond had other minerals from water. But they are now saying that it is from that area uh, that has water in it. And the geologists, scientists agree that it's from that transition zone uh, way deep under our feet. But the point is, Genesis 7-11 is describing fountains of the great deep burst open, is describing what science today is confirming. That the fact that science, all of the fountains open up, would indicate great seismic activity. Uh, such as had uh, as to what had been seen uh, today in what is called uh, the Ring of Fire uh, to make that happen. Basically, the Ring of Fire is a tectonic plate uh, movement that is still occurring uh, with great earthquakes, and geologists say that there's 452 known earthquakes along its path. In addition to evidence of the water in the deep, we can look at scripture. Uh, for what science has termed today as the evaporation cycle or water cycle uh, being clearly described before any man knew what the process was or how it worked. In addition to evidence of uh, the water and the deep earth, we can look in scripture uh, which talks about the evaporation cycle. Uh, Ecclesiastes 1, 6 through 7. Blowing towards the south and turning towards the north, the wind continues swirling along. And on its circular courses, the wind returns. All the rivers flow into the sea, yet the sea is not full to the place where the rivers flow. They, there they flow again. Um, so before the flood, there evidently used to be a type of greenhouse, a uh, type of canopy, canopy made of water, fog but also somewhat describing an evaporation cycle in this process. Genesis 2 and verse 6. But a mist used to rise from the earth and water the whole surface of the ground. And in all of this, Yahweh knew exactly what needed to be for life to exist. Uh, Dr. Jason Lyle, an astrophysicist, who wrote, Taking Back Astronomy, the Heavens Declare Science, or Declare Creation in Science, uh, confirms it, among other books. Uh, he did a creation uh, lecture called Creation Astronomy, viewing the universe through biblical glasses. There's also a DVD out by uh, AnswersInGenesis.org, which gives some interesting facts about uh, you know, different things. One of such is the moon is pulling away from the earth, uh, and mathematically it would be touching the earth you know, a billion years ago. Uh, he mentioned he mentioned that because scientists currently give 4.5 billion years for the universe, but this magnetic field 
uh, is measurable. And in a book called The Geology Book by Dr. John Morris, uh, the year 1965, when they started measuring, uh, it was 8.016 in their measuring. And in 1925, it was 8.147 in measurements. And then 1880, it I'm sorry, we're going backwards. Um, it's actually weaker and then comes to a stronger point. Uh, if we go from the bottom up, 1800s to, to 1965, actually they were able to measure back in 1800, 1835 exactly, uh, 8.558, uh, in which um, if they calculate further back, Dr. Lyle said that if we go back 5,000, 6,000 years, it's actually no problem. But if we go back, say, 8,000, 9,000 years, then there's a problem because the magnetic pull would be so strong it'd pull the iron out of one's body. And so these are things that they look at, uh, the creationists look at, but yet there are atheists and agnostics, but some are turning into creationists due to the discovery of DNA, which are clearly instructions as to how we are to live and, and how other things are made. Um, 1 Corinthians 15, verses, verse 39. All flesh is not the same, but there is one flesh of men, and another flesh of beasts, and another flesh of birds, and another of fish. So clearly Yahweh has set up the DNA, which are instructions for each and every uh, living thing. Trees produce trees. Uh, dogs produce dogs. There are different types, just as there are you know, humans, there, we have variations. But we don't have humans that turn into trees or frogs that turn into people, these type of things. And that's the point, and Scripture points that out. Romans 1.20, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. Uh, so we're told that Elohim created heaven and earth, and we have no reason to doubt it, but people do. In Genesis 1.1, 1, 1 says, In the beginning of uh, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. And scientists are now trying to show other planets which exist in the universe which can support life. Uh, they continually look for and listen to other signs of intelligent life. Yet many still fail to see that there is a creator who says that this earth is special and was created specifically to inhabit life. Uh, in Isaiah 45, 18, it, it brings us out. For thus says Yahweh, who created the heavens, he is the Elohim who formed the earth and made it. He established it and did not create it a waste place, but uh, formed it to be inhabited. I am Yahweh, and there is none else. So formed to be inhabited. The sun is just at the right location, as well as the moon. But as the moon is moving away from the earth, the earth is moving away from the sun each year or vice versa, the sun is moving away. But very slowly, but it's measurable. Yeah, Isaac Newton said that, you know, realized this when he said, atheism is so senseless, when I look at the solar system, I see the earth at the right distance from the sun to receive the proper amounts of heat and light. This did not happen by chance. But, you know, to the astronomer's credit, they are looking out and they see other planets that are basically in the right position they've found at least five or, or so, but there doesn't appear to be any life on them. And that's because, as we've already read, Yahweh produced life on this earth. Everything else is in, uh, uninhabited by any life. Um, the world is even described accurately in Scripture as a circle or a globe shape. We realize that uh, today that Yahweh's thumbprint is essentially on all creation. Because when you go down to the smallest minuscule subatomic particles, they're going around in circular motions. They themselves are around. And when you expand out into the universe, you have the same type of motions going on. Circular patterns, round things, these type of things. Um, Isaiah 40 in verse... Uh, 22, it is he who sets above the circle of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. So there are those who are teaching the earth is flat, uh, you know, who point 
to scriptures like this to show that there's a dome and that Yahweh sits on the top of it. Uh, there's a lot of different ideas uh, that are presented. One thing clearly seen is that the heavens are above the earth from whatever vantage point uh, one is. And because we have central, uh, central gravitational pull, we have people that are standing upside down in Australia that are standing upright. No offense to Australians for standing upside down. But, you know, we can clearly see this. And, you know, people travel to that part of the world. And, uh, you know, the moon looks different. You know, we see a visible crescent out here. And the crescent is uh, on the right, you know, beginning a new moon, the light, you know, and that goes around. But from their perspective, it's in reverse because they're looking at the moon out here, but from this vantage point. And we're looking at it from this vantage point, you know, north of the equator. So it's a little different uh, in different areas of the world. Um, Isaiah 55, verse 9. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So what are some of mankind's thoughts? Well, some believe that the earth is on a giant elephant who stands on a giant turtle who is swimming in a cosmic sea. That is a belief that some have today. Ancient Israel believed that the earth was literally on pillars. Now, interestingly enough, the Bible in Psalm 75 and verse 3 says that the earth is basically on pillars and the earth doesn't move out of its place. We're looking at figurative language, poetic language in the Hebrew. And that's, this is where we can get kind of confused if we don't consider that when we read passages like this. So that, you know, we understand that it's not actually talking about pillars, it's actually talking about a way that, uh, of a, a description that we can understand because his thoughts are so above our thoughts and his ways are above our, his, uh, you know, our ways. So this is something that we have to consider, that there are figurative uh, aspects uh, of the wording. It's like saying, you know, it's raining cats and dogs, but we know it's not literally raining cats and dogs. So we have this, some of that poetic language and, and phrases in our own uh, language. Um, but, you know, the, the literal description of the word here is that it's basically hovering in space. Uh, Job 26, 7, he stretches out the north over empty space and hangs the earth on nothing. It's not contradicting other scriptures that, would, that say that the earth is on, you know, on pillars because that is figurative and this is literal as we, you know, can see from space, you know, a blue marble. In fact, NASA runs basically a 24-7 uh, satellite just imaging the earth and it's always in a rotational, you know, pattern. And sometimes it's dark, sometimes it's light because of the sun position and these type of things, the satellite position. But going back to Isaiah 40 and 22, we see the heavens are spread out. They're basically expanding. And much to the scientists' surprise because of the Big Bang Theory, but about 15 years ago, they found out that it's expanding. The universe is expanding at an ever-increasing rate. And this and the fact that astronomers keep increasing the numbers of galaxies and planetary bodies makes, this, makes the following that much more impressive. Jeremiah 33, verse 22. Honey, can you give me a glass of water? <clears throat> As the host of heaven cannot be counted and the sand of the sea cannot be measured, so I will multiply the descendants of David my servant and the Levites who minister to me. I remember when they used to say that the planetary bodies were, you know, like 100 million uh, in the galaxies, you know, and the, each of the galaxies are 100 million. They're now saying it's actually 100 billion, um, and they're already saying that the galaxies actually may prove to be more than 200 billion in number. So it's quite, quite astounding that they keep increasing the numbers. <clears throat> um, 
and uh, they'll no doubt count more as the you know the satellites come out. They have uh, the Hubble telescope, but they have a new one that's coming out that's going to be a lot time, many times stronger than it. Um, Psalm 102, 25 through 27. Of old you founded the earth, and of the heavens are the work of your hands. Even they will perish, but you endure, and all of them will wear out like a garment. Like clothing you will change them, and they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will not come to an end. And while matter is decaying, and everything, as the Apostle Paul says, is going to be, or the Apostle Peter, rather, says, is going to be burned up, there is still some re reproduction happening here um, for the purpose of forming new stars and what are called nebula. Hence, uh, like clothing, you will change them and they will be changed. And of course, the black holes, which they now believe are in the center of every galaxy, including ours, and they say that the Earth is heading towards the black hole in our galaxy. Of course, it won't happen in our lifetime. <coughs> I hear a scream in the distance. Maybe some are already heading tw towards that black hole. But they, uh, you know, eventually everything will be sucked up like a vacuum given enough time, uh, in theory. Isaiah 51, 6. Lift up your eyes to the sky and then look to the earth beneath, for the sky will vanish like smoke and the earth will wear out like a garment. And its inhabitants will die in like manner. But my salvation will be forever, and my righteousness will not wane. So anciently, they couldn't look up and see the heavenly bodies, you know, that, that they are in a state of decay, but they also could not see nebulas, or nurseries for the stars, as they refer to them, made up of hydrogen gas, and they in turn create stars that, that you know, uh, brighten things up. Uh, they could, however, look at the earth and the rocks crumbling into dust and, of course, the devastation of fire, which can be readily, readily seen at times. We see physical laws, but with spiritual application and eternity in mind. But the most important thing here in Isaiah 51.6, though, is that we see a prophetic reference to our Savior, Yahshua the Messiah. He is the light that we see light in, or that, you know, he brings light to us. In fact... In Psalm 36, 9, it says, For with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. And I think this is another reference to uh, Yahshua and the close relationship he has with the Father. Further, in Psalm 104, it says, Blessed are blessed Yahweh, O my soul. O Yahweh, my Elohim, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty, covering yourself with light as a cloak, stretching out heaven like a tent curtain. So we see some continued figurative speech with some literal meaning involved as the heavens were stretched out. And as mentioned before, they are still moving outward at an accelerated rate, scientists find. I should mention that, and most of you already know this, that there are three heavens identified in scripture in descending order, the one being the invisible realm in which Yahweh and the angels are in, and the second one in the heavenly bodies, you know, the stars and uh, planets, and, and then down to what we can see immediately, the whirlwinds, clouds in our atmosphere. A study of Enoch and Elijah would be good for the first heaven. Uh, with that said, two heavens can be burned uh, because of physical matter. Second Peter 3, verse 7, But by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of unrighteous men. As science finds or uh, advances and finds more out through things like the Hadron Collector, you've probably heard of that. They spent about $7 billion on it. It's a big science project trying to find the, the God uh, atom or whatever they call it, the, mo the God molecule, I, they've actually called it. But, um, you know, they're, they're finding out more and more things. In a book called The God Effect by Greg... Brian Clegg, actually. Some things are brought out, such as entanglement theory. That's getting into quantum physics, which the idea of a connection between particles is presented. So things are connected, and 
uh, one molecule or a particular molecule or atom can affect another. Einstein said such a theory in his day was, quote, spooky, unquote, and dismissed it. But is this part of how Yahweh can know everything? I mean, does this translate into the spiritual? How, do, how does he know our prayer, your, your prayer, my prayer, your prayer, everyone's prayer, you, you know, if we're praying all at once, how can he know all that? Uh, I know this gets more into the, into the mind rather than the physical, but it's a starting point for the rest of the message. Uh, listen to what King David uh, says here. Psalm 139, verse 7. Where can I go from your spirit, or where can I flee from your presence? Also Jeremiah. Am I an L who is near, declares Yahweh, and not L far off? And not an L far off. Can a man hide himself in hiding places so that I do not see him, declares Yahweh. Do I not fill the heavens and the earth, declares Yahweh. So in thinking about this, you know, life is made up of atoms, the physical life, and molecules too, too small for the unaided eye to see. These subatomic particles are evidently able to phase in and out of seemingly nothingness. And scientists have actually documented evidence of this happening. So thinking about how things work in the physical realm, there appears to be more of a connection between the physical and the spiritual than we can understand at this time. Now remember, you know, the scientists know about 2% of all that can be known. So we're just starting to understand more, but it points to scripture in different ways, what they're finding out. So thinking about how things work in the physical realm, there appears to be that, that connection. But speaking of quantum physics, we have terms to explain the infinitely small, such as neutrinos, protons, positrons, electrons, antipotons, protons. Uh, scientists have theoretically named another element, neutralinos, which is dark matter. And they know it is matter because light can bend around it. So there's something there physically for the light to be able to bend around it. And they say dark matter actually makes up about 90% of the universe. Light molecules called photons are said by some scientists to be the first active molecules in creation, which takes us back to Genesis when he said, let there be light. Now there's some figurative aspects of that which we could look at as well. But knowing photons, uh, or these light molecules called photons being first in creation, some scientists are saying. And then we find this dark matter that makes up like 90%. I mean, there's just some things here that we're starting to understand that the Yahweh, when he said what he said in Genesis, makes sense, makes more sense to us now on different levels. But then think about how the physical can be connected somehow to the spiritual. We see in scripture the connection between Yahweh's spirit and us through the Messiah. 1 Corinthians 2, 14 through 16. But a natural man does not accept the things of the spirit of Elohim, for they are foolishness to him. And he cannot understand them, because they are spiritually appraised. But he who is spiritual appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no one. For who has known the mind of Yahweh that he will instruct him? But we have known the mind of Messiah. So when we think about Yahweh's spirit, uh, that it, it can work in conjunction with our own mind. And in just thinking about that, it's well basically mind-blowing if, if we consider it. But there have been some recent movies that have shown people's minds being uploaded to computers or a robot with a computer-type brain. The problem with this type of idea is that while our brain might be something akin to a, an organic computer, it's still a physical thing. But with a spiritual component, the working part in, and working in part in conjunction with the brain uh, is this mind aspect which allows us to think and create and you know, like no other species in the world. And this part actually goes back to Yahweh when we die. Ecclesiastes 12, 6 through 7. Remember him before the silver cord is broken and the golden bowl is crushed. The pitcher by the well is shattered and the wheel of the cistern is crushed. 
Then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the spirit will return to Elohim who gave it. So Yahshua the Messiah actually expressed this idea uh, when he said in Luke 23, 46, and Yahshua crying out with a loud voice said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. So this ruach in Hebrew or pneuma in Greek can be described as life or being. It can be described as mind or spirit. Essentially, the essence of a person we find from scripture will be returned at, at one of the two major resurrections. In Ezekiel chapter 37, for example, it appears to sh be showing that this connection, once again, being restored in a second resurrection for those uh, in what's been referred to as the Valley of Dry Bones. So even if one has turned to dust, a new body, a new brain, will function as it was previously, uh, but the person will know who he is or, or you know, was uh, when the connection is made, when, when that spirit is given back. So it's complicated, but yet some of the science is backing up uh, this idea of the spirit connecting with the physical through the subatomic particles. Uh, Hebrews 11.3, but I know that there's a lot more to it that we don't know. It says, by faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of Elohim, so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. So, you know, the Bible being inspired, it's, it's going over all these things for us to consider, especially in these last days in which, you know, it's just been over the last 20 years that a number of things have come up that really bring to light and give a deeper understanding of, of what Scripture is saying. But there's much more to come, I'm sure. But when it comes to the physical, biological brain, scientists can explain in part the workings of what is happening. They describe our brains as having one billion neurons, which are communicating with at least one million billion synapses or connections via nerves. These all send signals uh, occurring 1,000 times each second, which is one quadrillion, quadrillion, I, I'm not sure if we can even wrap our mind around that, that figure, but those events are happening every second while we're even listening you know, to me speaking here. But it's happening every second of every waking moment for every one of us. But other than these things, there are chemicals, hormones, nerves, proteins, various other molecules and processes in play. And just to let you know, they have already taken a tiny part of a mouse's brain, sliced it at least 25,000 times. Mind you, it's a small part. Scanned it and copied it into a, cop, a cloud drive, which took five months of continuous micron scopes recording and capturing every detail. Five months to go through this process. There were over 100 million images taken, which took up to three months to create a 3D model, which ended up taking over two million gigabytes of space. For you guys and, and gals and computers, you know that that's a lot of storage. The size, yeah, the size of the part of the brain they took uh, from the mouse, it was only the size of a grain. I took these particular notes uh, off of a YouTube video called, Can You Upload Your Mind and Live Forever? The channel is uh, called Kurzgesagt, that's K-U-R-Z-G-E-S-A-G-T, and basically it says in a nutshell next to that. I'm not sure if that's a German word for basically nutshell, but it says, with, well, uh, I watched it the other day. It just came out. Within the first 24 hours, there were two and a half billion, I'm sorry, two and a half million, don't want to go beyond what it actually says, 2.5 2 million. Woke up this morning, saw the same video, it's already over three million views. This is all within a day. And so there's a lot of people interested in this type of thing because they're, they're, they're doing things now. People are not wanting to die 
And, you know, just people are fascinated by the possibilities of living forever. And as Ecclesiastes 3.11 says, it says, he has set eternity in their heart. In other words, we all have a desire to live on. And that's been given to us from above. But scripture shows how this is achievable. And to even utilize a physical body afterwards if one desires, as Joshua did just that on the road to Emmaus in uh, Luke 24, or even showing himself to the disciples in that section of scripture. Vanishing and appearing in those accounts, even eating some fish uh, in them. In the book of John we read, John 20 and verse 9, uh, 19, so when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut where the disciples were, the for the fear of the Jews, Yahshua came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be to you. The doors were shut, and yet he showed up. How did he do that? It appears that he walks right through the walls or the doors, and certainly he could if he wanted to. Uh, but going back to the idea of matter phasing in and out of nothingness, which science has now shown is possible and is happening, the biblical accounts of Yahshua or even angels appearing and then disappearing, from and into the spiritual realm connects the science with the Bible or you know shows how you know what they're finding out now could relate to how this is being done I mean this is way beyond our comprehension and our minds tend to collapse when we think about some of these things how is that possible how how can Yahweh be in all things how can he know all things how can you know a spirit being just transform in front of us and become, you know, as a person. These are things that, you know, science, knowing about 2% of what there is to know, is starting to see a little bit of. But there's so much more that's coming, and this is why it's so important to overcome and to, to look forward to what is coming, because Yahweh is in charge, and he's preparing things that are, fan, you know, fantastic and wonderful uh, for those that love him. And so these are things that we look forward to. But it's interesting to look at some of the science and see what scriptures uh, you know, are saying uh, about some of these things. But as we find, you know, other things do as well you know, show up in, in science, such as age of accountability being the age of 20. Based upon current science, which shows the frontal lobe, the area specifically to long-term planning and goal setting, that doesn't fully develop until the age of 20, out of one's teen years. That's something that science now knows, but Yahweh, through the scriptures, in at least three different areas, gives us that idea of an age of accountability being 20. Science also shows the idea of circumcision on the eighth day of, uh, you know, a child you know, having that as a token of the Abrahamic covenant. You know, Yahweh put that instructions in Genesis 17, 12, on, specifically on the eighth day. Well, eight has a number of, like, new beginnings and, out, you know, time out of time and eternity and these type of things, which is good. But when we look at the science, uh, vitamin K and also the hormone prothombin, prothombin, P-R-O-T-H-O-M-B-I-N. They're both clotting agents in the blood, and they both come to optimal levels. In fact, the one goes a little above the optimal level at the eighth day. Yahweh knew what he was doing. And so these things are for us to, you know, to give us confidence that he knows what he's doing, that, and that science is actually backing up and, and confirming these things. So I started out quoting the you know, Wikipedia online encyclopedia. Science in the broadest sense refers to any knowledge or trained skill, especially but not exclusively when this is attained by verifiable means. Well, yes, there is science that is verifiable, and it actually does a good job of verifying the Bible. And there's a lot more that we could look at with you know, given time, but um, we'll go ahead and, and put that to the side and look at the subject a bit later.